In this video, we'll go through the first part of lecture one, which is the different types of nerve cells. Uh, broadly, there are two classes, neurons that are specialized for communication and glia that are there to support them. The mechanisms of cell death are the topic of the second video. So we've got two types of nerve cells. The neurons are the ones that sense the world, move our muscles, store our memories, and the glial cells are the cells that are there to support them. If you have a look at a few different neurons here, you can see they look a little different, but they have some similarities. Uh, they all have this central cell body, and they have some extensions coming off of them. So every neuron has cell body, and then some number of dendrites, and probably one axon. But these are all variable. For the cell body, this has what your typical eukaryotic cell has. It has a nucleus, which has DNA. Uh, here they've highlighted the nucleolus. That's where we make ribosomes, because that's what they're standing for here. Nissel substance, or ribosomes. And you'll notice the cell body is quite purple. That's because it has a lot of ribosomes in it. That's because the first main function of the cell body is to make proteins. The nucleus is where transcription occurs. And then the nissel substance is where translation occurs. The other important function of the cell body is to integrate synaptic or electrical potentials. So here we have one, two, three, four synapses on the dendrites of this neuron. The electrical potentials generated there all filter into the cell body. And if we take a look at the activity there, we're going to get a little bit of depolarization from synapse one a little bit more from two, a little bit more from three, a little bit more from four, and by golly, we've hit threshold and we're off to the races. We now spike, that is we fire action potentials. Now the axons and dendrites are there for communication. The axons are going to translate electrical activity to chemical signaling. The electrical activity in an axon is the action potential, and here it is right there. We'll see this in a little more detail later, but that electrical activity travels within the axon and it gets translated to neurotransmitters. That is the chemical message that passes between cells. So electrical within and chemical between. The dendrites translate the chemical message of neurotransmitters to an electrical message. That's what's going on down here. So in that purple neuron, right after the action potential, we get this little bit of depolarization. And that's caused by the binding of neurotransmitter to some neurotransmitter receptor, which come in two general types. Most commonly, we're dealing with ion channels. So when the neurotransmitter binds, the channel opens, and we get our change in membrane potential. Another type that are important are what we call metabotropic receptors. And rather than opening an ion channel directly, instead they turn on some enzyme to change the function of the neuron. Now, neurons communicate uh, to, in, in different ways because they have different morphologies. Some neurons are pretty simple. They're just relays. Unipolar cells, for example, which insects have, uh, we don't have them. Uh, we do have bipolar cells. We find them in the retina, for example, and pseudo-unipolar cells, which we find in the uh, dorsal root ganglia. So these innervate our skin, muscles, joints, so we can feel things in our body. Now notice both of these form pretty much a straight line from dendrite down to axon, dendrite directly into axon. These are simple relays, not a lot of thinking. Is there pressure on this patch of skin? Is there light in this area of the retina? Not every neuron is built that way. Most of the neurons in the central nervous system are multipolar. That is, they have more than one primary dendrite. And the primary dendrite is just the dendrite that comes off the cell body. Notice we've got one here, none over here. And for the multipolar neuron, we have one, two, three, four, five on this one, one, two, I don't feel like counting it, but notice it's more than one down here on these bottom three. This allows the neuron to get input from multiple sources. That is, they can think about more than one thing. This is important for uh, motor neurons. A lower motor neuron, for example, or an upper motor neuron, or a Purkinje cell in the cerebellum that's going to coordinate movement. So neurons, if they have to deal with more than one bit of information, are going to need more than one branch of dendrites. Their dendrites also vary in terms of whether or not they have spines or not. 
Here's a smooth, A-spiny, dendritic shaft. Notice there's no little protrusions coming off. Over here, though, see these little spines coming off? Those are dendritic spines. And these are the sites where we form excitatory synapses on this neuron. The cool thing about spines is that they're very plastic. If this synapse is deemed important over here, this one can grow and get much bigger, forming a stronger synapse. Hey, maybe that synapse doesn't get used that often. It's not that important. Hey, we can get rid of it. So spines are highly plastic. In other words, they change a lot. That's all this means. Because we can grow new spines, we can get rid of old spines, we can make them bigger, stronger, smaller, weaker. We think of dendritic spines as being very important for forming new, memory, uh, forming new memories and for getting irrelevant information. Now, don't sleep on the axon. The axon also has a lot going on, too. It can extend over maybe a small distance. Maybe it's a local circuit neuron, a couple millimeters, to considerable distances from your big toe to your brainstem. So axons are quite long. Um, although we only have one axon that comes off of the cell body, that doesn't mean we just talk to one target. No, this one axon coming off of this neuron over here gets into its target and then ramifies, branches extensively. We've got more axon over here than we do dendrite. Now the axon, like the dendrites, is made up of microtubules on the inside. And those microtubules are short because notice the axon doesn't form a straight line, but microtubules grow in a straight line. So we've got these little discontinuous branches of microtubules. These are really important for long distance transport. And that's critical because, well, no protein synthesis occurs in the axon. But proteins do everything in life. So, if we want our axon to do anything, and we do, we have to ship the proteins from the cell body on down the axon. And that's what occurs all day and all night in axonal transport. In case I didn't mention it, axons don't make proteins, but proteins do everything in life. This is a very fundamental mantra that you need to say. What we can see going on up here in this movie is axonal transport. And you'll notice those red dots are going in two different directions. Now, those red dots are some uh, protein that's important for keeping us alive. These are the track A receptors. More on track receptors in the second part. But we move in the anterograde direction. That is from the cell body on down to the end of the axon. And that's where we ship our new proteins. The old proteins come back along retrograde transport. That is, they go from the synapse back to the cell body. So we're always shipping stuff in both directions. New proteins from the cell body via anterograde and old proteins back to the cell body via retrograde axonal transport. And keep in mind, all of this happens on microtubules. Because this is necessary for survival, anything that messes with microtubules or axonal transport will kill the neuron. Now, the way that neurons function is by generating a membrane potential and then playing with it. The resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. And the membrane potential is exactly what it sounds like. It's a charge difference, that is a potential, at the membrane. It's the same thing you learned about in physics. We use the same symbol. Potential is still V, and the little m just tells us it's at the membrane. Now, you'll notice at rest, neurons are negative. That's our polarization, our resting membrane potential. When they're active, though, let's follow along down here. So here we're resting. We can hyperpolarize. No one really cares about this. A little depolarization, but not enough to hit threshold. Let's depolarize a little more, and whew, we get a spike. This is all the neuron's doing. When the neuron is active, it goes from negative to positive membrane potential and then back. That's the action potential. Here it is in a little more detail. So when we hit threshold potential, that's what happened here, we're off to the races. We depolarize, going from negative to a positive membrane potential, because sodium enters the cell. Sodium has a positive charge. So we fill the cell up with positive charge. 
That triggers the release of neurotransmitters. More on that in neurobiology. This doesn't go on forever, though. After we bring in some sodium, the neuron then terminates this process by spitting out potassium. So notice sodium enters, potassium leaves, and both have a positive charge. So at the early phase of the action potential, we fill the cell up with positive charge. And then when we enter the repolarization phase, we let the positive charge leave. This is kind of a lie, but it'll work for now. The whole point of an action potential is, of course, not to just go from negative to positive and back. That accomplishes nothing. The whole point is to stimulate neurotransmitter release. And that's what the depolarization does. We then spit out neurotransmitters to create some kind of synaptic potential. The synaptic potentials are generated in the dendrites, as we went through earlier. And there's two types. There are the excitatory potentials. These make a neuron more likely to be active because they depolarize. Remember, at rest, our polarization is minus 70 millivolts. Notice it's negative. So if we depolarize, we get rid of the negative charge. In other words, we become more positive. Inhibitory synapses create the opposite type of potential. Those synaptic potentials hyperpolarize. In other words, they give us even more negative potential. Now, the chemical signaling passes between neurons, and this occurs at sites called synapses. Here's the synapse. And there's at least two parts. Typically, we think of it as having a third glial element, but we can just talk about these two for now. Glia will come up in a bit. The presynaptic site is typically the axon. And this is where we release neurotransmitters. When the action potential arrives, here's our depolarization there, that depolarization triggers this vesicle to fuse and our neurotransmitters to fuse out, turning on neurotransmitter receptors. They can allow charge to flow into this second neuron here, the postsynaptic site, which is typically on the dendrites. Not always, but usually. Now, there's a lot of neurotransmitters. We don't need to know them all for this class. We should definitely know glutamate because it's excitatory, and I put three stars next to it. The reason I put three stars next to it is because too much glutamate will kill you, and that's kind of what this class is about. GABA and glycine are the inhibitory counterparts to glutamate. They turn neurons off, preventing them from killing themselves, so we probably won't talk about them too much in this class. Acetylcholine is really important in the peripheral nervous system where it excites muscles. It still does stuff in the central nervous system. It might be excitatory, might be inhibitory, it depends. And then we have what we call the neuromodulatory transmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. These can be excitatory or inhibitory, depending on the receptor. And the same thing is true for the dozens of neuropeptides. More details on that in neurobiology. I want you to focus on glutamate for this class because it's very much related to the pathology and pathophysiology of numerous disorders. I want to reiterate the alternating pattern of electrical and chemical signaling that occurs between neurons, and I think a great way to do that is the corticospinal tract. So here we have two neurons, upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. Upper motor neurons are found above lower motor neurons, and you find them in the cerebral cortex. So here's our big wrinkly brain over here. If we look at a coronal section through it, you'll notice some upper motor neurons map to the lower limb, the upper limb, the face. There's a map. Those neurons project from the cortex on down into the brainstem to control the face and the spinal cord to control the body. What they're going to do there is release glutamate to stimulate the lower motor neuron. Notice, if an upper motor neuron fires an action potential, that's the electrical event within, it passes a chemical message, glutamate, between the upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. Glutamate's excitatory, so now we've turned on our lower motor neurons in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. And there's an organization. Those lower motor neurons around the midline tend to control the trunk. Those toward the sides tend to control more distal muscles. There's also an organization of the corticospinal tracts, the lateral corticospinal tracts, 
tends to control the limbs. And notice, it's near those upper motor neurons. I'm sorry, those lower motor neurons. And the anterior corticospinal tract, shown in blue here, controls the axial muscles of the trunk. And notice it's closer to those lower motor neurons. Okay, so if we dump enough glutamate onto them, lower motor neurons, fire and action potential, we're off to the races. We're not spitting out glutamate. Instead, now we're spitting out acetylcholine. This excites the muscle, causing it to fire an action potential. Looks a little different. Looks a little more like that. But notice, we're just going electrical to chemical. The electrical will consider to be the synaptic potentials and the action potentials that then lead to neurotransmitters, which are the chemical signal passed between cells. Neurotransmitters, of course, stimulate the synaptic potentials which then lead to an action potential. And you can see it's a big cycle, alternating between electrical and chemical signaling. Electrical within, chemical between. Now, neurons, of course, don't do this on their own. They are aided by a variety of glial cells. We'll start with the myelinating glial cells. Olga dendrocytes and Schwann cells create myelin, which is this lipid-rich covering of the axon. Here it is shown in purple. Here it is shown in real life. So here's a cross section through an axon. We can see the axon here. Here's a little mitochondrion that got sliced. And then we have layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. You get the point of myelin, which insulates the inside of the axon from the outside of the cell. What this does is increase conduction velocity about tenfold, as you can see here, and decreases the cost about 70-fold. So action potentials are faster and cheaper. This also saves space. If you were an invertebrate, like a squid, you don't have a, a skull. You got all the room in the world. You can just make your axons bigger. And in fact, that's what they do. We have these little tiny 20 micron axons. Squid, the squid giant axon is about 50 times larger than ours. It's a millimeter. You can see it with a naked eye. That's why we studied it first. If we think about the area of the axon, that's 50 times 50, that's 2,500 times larger than our axons. That means that our spinal cords would have to be the size of a redwood tree trunk. That's not gonna help us. So we myelinate and we save some space. And we also speed up conduction. It creates what we call saltatory conduction. That means the uh, charge seems to leap along the axon. It leaps down the internodes, that's the myelinated section, so it leaps from node to node. So at the node, we get that depolarization, the action potential, and it passively moves through the internode. This is very fast, but the charge is much weaker. So we're not as depolarized, but it's enough to get us above threshold. So we recharge the action potential, and it heads on down to the next node, where we recharge the action potential. A couple different types of myelin. A compact uh, form of myelin is made in the C and S by oligodendrocytes. Notice the C and the C. I'm trying to align those for you. This is to save space. Again, we've got a skull. We make a pillowy myelin in the peripheral nervous system with Schwann cells. In other words, it's not compact. This gives us cushion in case anything is pushing on our nerves. And we don't need that insurance policy in the central nervous system. We've got a skull. In case anything bad happens, microglia are there. Uh, microglia are not actually nerve cells. They are derived from the yolk sac, and they sneak their way into the brain before we have a blood-brain barrier. So this happens early on in development, and they live there the rest of their lives. Their function is to act as macrophages. In other words, eat up anything that shouldn't be there or dispose of cell debris as neurons die. At rest, microglia look like they do over here on the left, Notice they kind of look like little tiny neurons. They have a stellate appearance. If injury occurs or infection, they now look like little amoebas. And that just allows them to crawl to the site of injury and do what they do. More on that in a little bit. All the other functions, for the most part, are handled by astrocytes, which means star cells. One of the things they have to do is, of course, talk to the blood. This is where all the glucose comes from that we use to pay all the bills and the brain is an expensive organ. So here's, a, here's an astrocyte. 
There's an astrocyte, there's another. The white stain here is just showing you an intermediate filament in astrocytes called GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein. So we can kind of see the morphology of this astrocyte here. And if you look at this, you can clearly see a blood vessel running through this image. And it's surrounded by end foot processes. So this is one type of process for astrocytes. It talks to the vasculature. It helps control blood flow. If, we're, if our brain's a lot more active, we need more blood flow to that area so we can pay the bill. It helps maintain the blood-brain barrier. So, um, you know, nasty things in the blood can't get into the brain. It doesn't make the blood-brain barrier, but it helps maintain it. And by, integrate, by uh, communicating with the blood, it can bring in lots of really useful things, uh, namely glucose, so we can pay the bill. Because neurons are running up a big bill. Hell, those action potentials aren't free, right? As this neuron down here is conducting its action potential on down with that saltatory conduction, sodium's flowing in, potassium's flowing out. We got to pump them back across. That ain't free. We need metabolic support. And that's where the second type of process comes in, the perinodal process, that is near the nodes. So at this site, when the action potential arrives, we depolarize. What we're going to do here is start to spit out a whole bunch of potassium. We need to clean it up. We don't want it going everywhere and depolarizing its neighbors. No, no, no. So we don't let that happen. Perinodal processes here buffer that potassium. And also then provides a little glucose back to the axon so it can make ATP and pay the bill. Although axons can't make proteins, they can make ATP. They do have mitochondria, and they need to make ATP. The third type of process is the perisynaptic process that is near the synapse. Okay, here's our presynaptic site, the axon, postsynaptic, the dendrite, and here's the third element, the perisynaptic process. This is there to remove neurotransmitters. Let's say we're spitting out a little glutamate here to excite this postsynaptic neuron. If we don't clean up that glutamate, bad things are going to happen. So we're going to clean that up with the perisynaptic process. We've got uh, glutamate transporters over here, these little yellow jelly beans. So they'll take that glutamate and whoop, remove it from the synapse. We'll also pick up the potassium that's released by the action potential here. So we still buffer that potassium. And we also give things back to the neuron. Hey, the release of glutamate, the creation of those postsynaptic potentials over here, that ain't free. So the astrocyte also provides metabolic support here. Let's give them a little glutamate or pyruvate or something like that. And they may very well release their own transmitters, not called neurotransmitters, but of course called gliotransmitters because they're glia. Now the importance of picking up neurotransmitters is highlighted in these data. The open circles are what we call wild type mice or control. And then we have uh, the glutamate transporter knockout mice. So here we'll say no uptake. Notice the difference in their growth. That's what's shown on the y-axis here in panel A. As we move up, the mouse is getting bigger. And here's your typical mouse growth curve. Notice their runts when we don't pick up the glutamate. That's not their big problem, though. That's shown over here in panel B. Survival is on the y-axis. Most mice should be able to live beyond 12 weeks with no problems. Notice in my glutamate transporter knockout mice here, they start to rapidly die after about two weeks of birth. What's going on here is this. That's a mouse having a seizure. And it's having that seizure because there's an excess of glutamate causing these little bursts of epileptiform activity right here and here. You don't see any seizures in control mice. So the neurons get overly stimulated, they die, and as the neurons go, so does the mouse. Now when injury occurs, and it will many times in this class, astrocytes and microglia are there to clean up the mess. And they do that in a process called reactive gliosis. That is, the glia are going to grow a bit and adopt a different function. So the first thing that happens is there's this positive feedback loop of pro-inflammatory signaling. Microglia and astrocytes release a whole bunch of pro-inflammatory cytokines 
to help control their function and that of other immune cells. Notice it's a positive feedback loop. Microglia turn on astrocytes, which then turn on microglia, which then turn on astrocytes, which then turn on microglia, and you see where this is going. Now these pro-inflammatory cytokines also head on out and talk to other immune cells. But that's only if it's a profound injury or infection. We don't want to bring in white blood cells to the brain. That's bad for you. More on that later. Once we've turned on our microglia and astrocytes with this pro-inflammatory signaling, they do a couple different things. Microglia are there to act as macrophages. The astrocytes are there to quarantine the area, and they do that by forming the glial scar. This is the same GFAT from earlier, and what you'll notice is that around this site, here's where we have an infarct, an area of injury. Let's look down here. This is the same slide, it's just blown up a bit. So here's my infarct, we had a little stroke. This tissue is dead, and right there at the edge, we have ourselves the glial scar. That's what this is. This quarantines that damaged area and prevents anything nasty there from affecting the rest of that healthy tissue. So even though there might be a lot of dangerous and damaging stuff floating around here, it can't get past the glial scar. <clears throat> so the glial scar is kind of a good thing in that it protects healthy tissue from being damaged by pathological tissue. But the problem is that it also blocks the regrowth of axons. So recovery in the central nervous system is limited following damage. And it might actually contribute to the problem by altering astrocyte function. Remember all the things that astrocytes do. Hey, I'm talking over here to the blood. I pick up a little glucose. You're running up a bill over here. Let me feed you. I can only do that if I have the appropriate perisynaptic and perinodal processes. But if I alter my structure to form the scar, I've lost my normal functions. And now I stop feeding the neuron. Hell, I stop cleaning up glucose as well. I'm sorry, cleaning up glutamate as well. That's going to contribute to dysfunction of the neuron, its death, and the loss of synapses. So not only do I screw up the neuron, I also stop supporting the blood-brain barrier. And now blood vessels get leakier. Nasty things can enter. Could be uh, infectious agents or could be white blood cells could be small molecules that damage neurons, whatever. The blood-brain barrier now lets bad things come into the brain, contributing to damage. So reactive gliosis is a good thing in small doses, but when it runs amok, there are consequences, and we'll review these again later on in this class. Now, at this point, you should be able to handle these questions before moving forward. In the second part of this video, we will review the mechanisms of cell death that we'll touch on for the rest of this class. If anything here is confusing, please fill out the questions box so I know what to talk about in class. I'll see you there.